Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first recorded lecture of Bio 101 Online. We'll be talking today about Chapter 1, A View of Life. So we'll begin with Section 1.1, Characteristics of Life. So you are enrolled in a biology class, but what is biology? We could define biology as the scientific study of life. And life as we know it is incredibly diverse. So here we have some images of different life forms on planet Earth. And on the most simple side, we have bacteria. Bacteria are very simple in structure and function. Um, they have only, they're each made of one cell each. We'll talk a little bit more about that soon. Moving up in complexity, we have this paramecium, which is a type of protist. Here, this is a moral mushroom, which is a type of fungus. Here we have a sunflower. That's a type of plant. And of course, this octopus is an example of an animal. And us humans are animals as well. So all of these are living things. But what exactly is life? What do all living things have in common? This is an interesting question to ask. So right now, I want you to pause this video and make a list of characteristics that you think are shared by all living organisms on planet Earth. So pause here and think about what characteristics are shared by all living organisms, whether you're a bacterium, a fungus, a plant, an animal, etc. So here's a list that I came up with. Living things use and require energy. They respond to external stimuli. They maintain homeostasis. They evolve and adapt. They can grow, develop, and reproduce. They are organized and they are made of cells. This is a very comprehensive list of what characteristics are shared by all living things. And we'll talk about each of these bullets in this lecture. So despite the diversity of life, all living organisms share a lot in common, as we just, saw, we just saw. And most importantly, all living organisms are composed of cells. If you're not made of cells, you're not alive. The cell is the basic unit of structure and function of all living things. And chapter four will talk explicitly about the cell. Because you're made of cells, um, you could be either a single cell or you could be many cells. So you could be unicellular, like a bacterium, there's only one cell, or you can be multicellular. So we have over 30 trillion cells in our body. So we are multicellular organisms. And in fact, each cell has a life of its own. So if you were to zoom in on a cell, you would see a lot going on. There's an inner life within each cell and all living things are made of cells. So I want you to look at this video. I'm just gonna start over here and I'll lower the volume a little bit. This is called the inner life of the cell. This was an animation done by Harvard um, some years ago. And this is a look of what's going on inside each of your cells right now. You have different proteins being assembled and these speeds are pretty accurate. Um, this is remarkable. These are like the bones of the cell. These are called the cytoskeleton proteins. This is called a microtubule. And you're gonna see something very cool Right here, this is called a motor protein. These guys are walking right now inside of your cells, carrying huge vesicles of materials. So we have all this going on inside each of our cells. And by the end of this course, you're going to know what's going on in this video. So I'd like you to watch the entirety of the video uh, when you have a chance. This is called the inner life of a cell. So we'll talk now about what characteristics are shared by all living things. And let's start by saying that life requires balance. All living things maintain homeostasis. And homeostasis is the maintenance of internal conditions 
within certain boundaries. In other words, we can say that homeostasis is a biological balance. So all living things are made of cells, and all living things require a biological balance. We need to make sure that we can keep our internal conditions within a very narrow range. So this could include um, many things, from temperature to uh, fluid intake. But we need to be able to respond to changes in the environment. So if it gets very hot out, we need to be able uh, to control what's going on inside our body, or else we will die. So there's a quote you might have heard, um, everything exists in a delicate balance. And I'm pretty sure you've all heard this quote before when you were very young. Um, it was actually said by Mufasa in The Lion King in reference to the circle of life and how all living things are connected. All living things require a delicate balance to exist. An example of homeostasis can be found in a thermostat. So a thermostat keeps a room at a certain temperature. Humans don't like very extreme temperatures inside. We like to be around, let's say, 70 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. So we like this comfortable room temperature. But let's say it's a very hot day in the environment and it gets very warm in the room. What happens is the thermostat senses that change. It realizes that it's not at that comfortable 70 degrees, so it will tell the heater to shut off. The heater, not being on anymore, will cool down the room until we're at that comfortable room temperature again. So that's an internal equilibrium, so to speak. We want to keep this nice and warm. We want to keep it at the right comfortable temperature. But let's say the room gets too cold. Again, the thermostat will sense that it's deviated from the comfortable room temperature, and then it will tell the heater to turn back on again. The room will then warm up until it gets back to that comfortable room temperature. And of course, anytime you deviate from that room temperature, whether it's too cold or too warm, the sensor will act accordingly. Our brain and our nervous system is like the thermostat. That's like the sensor. Right? So the thermostat is just an analogy for how all living things maintain internal constancy. So in response to a temperature change in the environment, it will adjust the heat to a constant temperature, just like our brain would do. Is a thermostat alive? You should say no. And a very simple answer, it's not made of cells. So even though it can respond to stimuli and it can maintain homeostasis. It even uses energy. Um, it's not alive because it's not made of cells. So humans have an internal thermostat in the brain um, that maintain temperature and fluid homeostasis. When we get cold, when our body temperature is too low, we then shiver, which increases heat. Um, and then that will resume our body temp, bring our body temperature back up to where it should be. We're always also always fluctuating around the optimal balance of nutrients, sugar, salt, and water. Right? Our body needs to be balanced. If there's an imbalance, our body makes us fix that with homeostasis. So for example, our blood pressure is always fluctuating throughout the day. When our blood pressure is too low, our body tells us that we're thirsty. So we'll go drink some water. That will increase the fluid in our body and boost up our blood pressure back to normal. So a lot of these things are not even conscious. And a lot of these things are unbeknownst to us because our body is always making sure that we're in homeostasis, that we're in this biological balance. Um, so another example, of, so thirst is a good example, and heat with homeostasis. But also, again, if our blood sugar is low, our body naturally will release um, glucose from our liver, so the concentration in our blood is just right. And vice versa, after a really uh, sugary meal, we have a lot of blood sugar. We have too much sugar in our blood. So our body can recognize that, right? Specifically, the pancreas has a very important role in this. Um, and in response to high blood sugar, 
our liver can store it as a healthier molecule called glycogen. So in response to a sugary meal, you'll have too much sugar in your blood, but our bodies are alive and they maintain homeostasis. So they'll just take that sugar out of the blood and store it. So you always have the right amount of sugar in the blood, not too much and not too little. Another characteristic of life is that living things develop, grow, and reproduce. And all living things must be able to reproduce to maintain a population. But there are some exceptions. Think of you, um, I'll be curious if you can think of any off the top of your head. A good example would be a mule. So a mule is actually unable to reproduce because it's a hybrid animal of a horse and a donkey. So when a horse and a donkey mate, they produce mules, but a mule cannot reproduce itself. So there are some exceptions. And of course, not every individual reproduces, right? Not all humans decide to have children, um, but there must be enough reproduction in a certain species to maintain that population. And when an organism reproduces, they pass on copies of their genes to the next generation. And these genes are made of DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, which is a molecule that carries genetic information. So genes are made of DNA and genes contain genetic information. So we pass on our genetic information from generation to generation. Our cells use those instructions, they use that DNA to produce proteins. And proteins do the actual work of the cell. So it's almost like DNA is the software with the instructions or the code, and proteins are the hardware that actually do the work that the cell needs to do. DNA may be stored in a cellular compartment called the nucleus. So some cells, like our cells, have a special compartment called the nucleus where DNA is stored. Um, all cells that store DNA in a nucleus are called eukaryotes. Eukaryotes, that will be an important word. Cells that do not store DNA in a nucleus, like bacteria, for example, are called prokaryotes. So all living things must reproduce, but reproduction can be either asexual or sexual. In asexual reproduction, only one parent is involved and all the offspring are genetically identical to the parent. So let's take the strawberry plant as an example. This strawberry plant reproduces asexually sometimes, um, and it could produce these little plantlets, these little offshoots, which are all, these are all genetically identical to the parent. So they're basically clones of each other. An asexual reproduction is a successful strategy in unchanging environments. Um, a good way to think about this is if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? So if the strawberry plant is doing well and it's a current environment, why do sexual reproduction? Why use the energy? Um, why take the risk? Just clone yourself. So plants um, and bacteria oftentimes do asexual reproduction in unchanging environments. In sexual reproduction, two parents are involved and the offspring are genetically different from either parent. And this is a successful strategy in changing environments since the offspring are unlike either parent. So take a second to think about why this can be. Why would sexual reproduction be advantageous in changing environments? So a good answer would be you're going to maximize the success right, the, or maximize the chance of success of all of your offspring if you have more options. So if you can diversify and you mix genes together, you're going to have different offspring with different advantages. So if the environment were to change, you're going to have a better chance of at least one of those offspring being able to survive in that changing environment. Whereas if you were just to reproduce asexually, if you die, all of your offspring die as well. So sexual reproduction might cost um, more energy, um, but it does pay off. And we'll talk more about sexual reproduction um, when we discuss meiosis in chapter 10.
So whether you reproduce um, asexually or sexually, the strawberry plants and the swan both started off as a single cell. And that single cell divided and divided and divided until it grew into a multicellular organism. Another characteristic of life is that life requires energy. And energy is the capacity to do work. We need energy to maintain organization and to do all of our life-sustaining processes, like chemical reactions. So we can't, no such thing as a free lunch. You need energy in order to make things work. And on planet Earth, the sun is the ultimate source of energy for nearly all living things. Plants, algae, um, and some uh, bacteria as well capture energy from the sun and do something called photosynthesis. Photosynthesis, right, photo means light, so it converts the energy from light, synthesizes it into chemical energy of carbohydrates. So basically, plants take the energy from the sun and convert that into sugars that they can use um, to build things, that they can build their leaves from that, and they can also do other reactions um, that are required to maintain life. So again, all living things require energy to do chemical reactions. And the metabolism, or a metabolism is the sum of all the chemical reactions that occur in a cell. So metabolism is all the different chemical reactions um, that a cell does. So all living things have to have a metabolism. All living things require energy. Living things obtain energy in different ways though. So we said that the sun is the ultimate source of energy. And here we have a plant. And this plant is referred to as a producer because this plant can produce its own energy. A producer extracts energy and nutrients from the non-living environment. So this plant is extracting energy from the sun and materials that are non-living from the soil to, to live. And that's how it gets its energy and materials from non-living um, sources. These guys are called autotrophs because they automatically make their own energy. This bug over here cannot produce its own energy, right? It can't just sit in the sun and produce sugars. This bug is called a consumer because it must consume a producer or another organism in order to make energy. So consumers obtain energy and nutrients by eating, by consuming other organisms. So we are consumers. Consumers are also called heterotrophs. And finally, a third category would be decomposers. And decomposers are consumers that obtain nutrients from dead organisms and organic wastes. So decomposers like fungi, like mushrooms, rely on the materials produced by broken down organisms that are already decomposing. So we have producers that extract energy from the non-living environment. We have consumers that have to eat other organisms for energy. And then we have decomposers which use the building blocks that remain of decomposing living things and uh, other wastes that are found in the soil. At each step of this process, heat is lost. So what this means, energy flows from the sun through plants and other members of the food chain as they feed on one another. And the energy gradually dissipates and returns to the atmosphere as heat. And because energy does not cycle, ecosystems cannot stay in existence without solar energy and the ability of photosynthetic organisms to absorb it. So we require constant energy from the sun so plants can absorb that energy and provide a source of energy for consumers like us. So this over here is a rapid response question. So these come up 
um, here and there throughout my lectures. And when you see this, you should pause and see if you can answer the question right away, because I'm going to give away the answer. So an organism that can synthesize its own energy is called a, Let's pause here. So the answer is a producer, D. So living things are also organized. And the level of biological organization ranges from atom to biosphere. So we're going to talk um, next about how living things are organized. The smallest possible unit of organization that we'll talk about in this course is an atom. And an atom is not alive. So an atom is um, a unit of an element that's composed of electrons, protons, and neutrons. We'll talk about atoms in chapter two. Atoms make up molecules. So when multiple atoms come together, they form molecules. Molecules come together to form larger molecules that make up living things or make up cells. So a cell is the first living unit. So molecules make up cells. And if you wanted to put an intermediate between molecules and cells, you can say that molecules make up organelles, which are many organs that are found in cells. And those organelles then make up cells. Cells then make up tissues. And what a tissue is, is a group of cells that have a common structure and function. So let's take a step back for a second. We'll say that oxygen is an example of an atom. Methane is an example of a molecule because it contains multiple atoms. This nerve cell over here contains methane and a lot of other molecules and organelles. And this tissue, nervous tissue, is made up of a bunch of the same type of cell, like nerve cells, that are all doing um, the same kind of function. So nervous tissue is composed of nerve cells and other types of connective tissue, but they're all doing the same thing. They're all trying to transmit um, electrical information, so to speak. And tissues make up organs. So an organ is composed of multiple tissues that all perform a specific task. So the brain is an organ that is made up of nervous tissue. Nervous tissue is made up of nerve cells. Nerve cells are made up of molecules, which are made up of atoms. And finally, or almost finally, organ systems, right, are composed of several organs working together. And that's what makes an organism. So let's take another example. Let's this tree is an organism that's composed of different organ systems. So believe it or not, one organ system of the tree is the shoots, another are the branches, another is the trunk, another is the roots. So this organ system we'll look at are the shoot system, which is made up of leaves, which is an organ. This is made, this leaf is made up of different tissue types, which are made up of cells, which are made up of molecules and atoms. So as we move up the hierarchy, each level acquires new emergent properties or new unique characteristics that are determined by the interactions between the individual parts. So when these components interact, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So this one brain cell on its own cannot do much. But when multiple of them come together and interact in such a way, they can produce a structure like the brain. And the brain, because of the intricate structure of those interacting brain cells, can produce memory. And memory is a huge concept, right? That is much greater than just the brain itself. And memory can only occur if the structure of those brain cells are just right for them to function perfectly to produce memories. So everything in biology um, is about structure and function. And in biology, structure determines function. So because the brain cells are structured this way, they can function by interacting with each other to produce memory. So the emergent properties arise at each level of biological organization. So, 
now we're going to take a step above organism. So here we have organisms, and a population is a group of organisms that live in the same area. So one bison is an organism, but a herd of bison is a population. So all the members of one species in a particular area belong to a population. Populations that live together in a defined area are called communities. So a community might consist of all the bison, but also the grass and the snakes and this hawk. And communities make up ecosystems. When you include the non-living surroundings, like the air and the mountain, um, so things that are not alive comprise the non-living, uh, sorry, things that are not alive plus all the communities of living things make up the ecosystem. And all of the ecosystems are found in the biosphere. So the biosphere is the part of Earth that contains all ecosystems. So bio means life, right? So biosphere is all um, life-containing parts of Earth. So again, let's take this um, from top to bottom. So the biosphere is all the regions of Earth's crust, waters, and atmospheres that are um, inhabited by living things. An ecosystem is a community plus its physical environment. So e biospheres have ecosystems. Ecosystems consist of communities. Communities consist of populations. Populations consist of organisms. An organism consists of organ systems. Organ systems consist of organs. Organs consist of tissues. Tissues consist of cells. Cells are made up of organelles, which are made up of molecules. Molecules are made of atoms. So make sure you can memorize this um, and think of examples for each of these um, levels of organization. So right now you should be able to think about what comes before this level, before cells, and what comes after organisms. So pause here to test your understanding of how life is organized. Here's a little cheat sheet to help you. So which of the following is the smallest? So pause here. The answer is C, an atom. And I like this um, little Venn diagram because this shows you the hierarchy of organization. So atoms, molecules, organelles, cells, and these are all in red because these are too small to see with the unaided eye. Everything here in blue, we could see tissues without a microscope and organs and organ systems, etc. So now we will move on to section 1.2, evolution and the classification of life. So you might want to pause here um, before we move on to section 1.2. So, over time, living organisms adapt based on their surroundings. And an adaptation is any modification that would make an organism better able to function in a particular environment. It's important to know that adaptations are always unintentional, but they provide a framework for evolutionary change. So let's take this, the example of these bears. This bear did not choose to be white, um, but the fact that it is white allows it to adapt because it can camouflage with the white snow in the background and then prevent being eaten by a predator. So this was an adaptation that was not intentional, but it did allow the organism to be able to function better in that environment. Evolution is something that all living things do. All living things evolve. And keep in mind, the definition of evolution is very specific. Evolution is the change in a population of organisms over time to become more suited to the environment. Evolution does not occur in individuals. It does not happen in a lifetime. So evolution is the change in a population of organisms over generations to allow that population to become more suited to an environment. 
the theory of evolution helps explain both the diversity of life and the unity of life. So the theory of evolution explains how we all came from a single cell. All living things have a common ancestor. Right? But yet, different environments allowed different adaptations to occur, and that allowed for a lot of diversity because the Earth has so many different environments, and throughout history, there have been so many environmental changes um, that it allowed this offshoot of so many different life forms. All right, so the evolution, uh, the theory of evolution suggests how all living things descended from a common ancestor. And the perfect way to think about the theory of evolution is common descent with modification. So common descent with modification is a good way to look at this because it means that descent occurs from common ancestors. So here's like the first primitive cell. And every time that we got an offshoot from this common cell, there is some kind of a modification made. So we have common descent. We all descended from an ancestor. But at every step of the way, there were some modifications made. And these modifications allowed the organisms to be adapted to their environment. So the diversity of life exists because over long periods of time, organisms responded to the changing environments by developing new adaptations. And of course, these organisms didn't decide to change because the environment changed. Um, this happened because of natural selection. And natural selection is the evolutionary mechanism proposed by Charles Darwin and Alfred Wallace. So Wallace actually also proposed the same idea um, at the same time as Charles Darwin, but Darwin gets all the credit. Natural selection says that some aspect of nature selects traits that are more beneficial to be passed on to the next generation. So natural selection means that nature selects traits of organisms that are more beneficial to be passed on. This is known as survival of the fittest, or more fit is actually death of the weakest. So if a trait does not make an organism stronger, it might not be passed on. And if a trait makes an organism weaker, that might be, that might mean the death of the organism. So that trait will be eliminated from the population if it's not um, beneficial or if it's harmful. And mutations fuel natural selection. So a mutation is a change in DNA, basically. So changes in our genetic instructions fuel natural selection. So think about why that is. So mutations help introduce variation. And if you have variation in a population, we have multiple ways of succeeding, of, you know, of surviving. Same idea as in sexual reproduction. You want to maximize variation so you get the best chance of uh, success. So that's what mutations and natural selection does, right? Mutations give us lots of variation so that nature can select which of those varieties can survive the longest. So if genes suddenly lost their ability to mutate, think about what can happen. So I'm going to give you a basic example of evolution first and natural selection, and then we'll apply it. Um, we'll apply some more examples as well. So let's think about bacteria because bacteria reproduce and evolve quicker than any other organism we know about. And in a population of bacteria cells, there's naturally genetic variation. So over time, DNA just mutates. So these cells might all be different from each other um, very slightly. And this red cell, by chance, sorry, I'm going to get to that red cell in a second. Right. So over time, genetic variation increases as genes acquire more mutations. This happens just naturally. We always acquire mutations in our genes. After a random mutation, this red cell, this red cell had a mutation in a gene that makes them resistant to the effects of antibiotics. So an antibiotic is a chemical that kills most bacteria. 
But for whatever reason, this one red cell over here mutated so that it's not affected by antibiotics. It will survive even in the presence of antibiotics. So what would happen if I treat this population of bacteria with antibiotics? So think about what would happen. Right, what would happen is all of the green cells would die. Right, antibiotics would kill off most of the bacteria, but the resistant red bacteria would survive and reproduce. Right, so if you choose to uh, treat with antibiotics, most of the green cells will die from the antibiotic, but the red cells have an adaptation and how they have a trait that allows them to survive in this environment of antibiotics. So over multiple generations of selection by antibiotics, the red cells are going to become more abundant. Evolution would then have occurred. This is again evolution because over many generations, a population of organisms has changed, right? It wasn't one bacteria cell overnight. It was a group of bacteria cells that changed in response to a uh, a change of the environment, which was antibiotic exposure. Um, and again, it's not like the bacteria chose to be resistant after they saw the antibiotic. The mutation was random and it happened before these bacteria ever witnessed antibiotics. So when the environment changed suddenly, it just so happened that these red cells could survive. And then these red cells will then overtake the population. So in this case, what is selecting and what is being selected? Right, so again, the selecting agent is the antibiotic and it's selecting for antibiotic resistance. Here's another example. Um, and the theory of natural selection says that there must be four qualifications met. Overproduction. It means that all species tend to produce more individuals that can actually survive. There's also variation in populations. So all individuals are different just by chance because of mutations. We then just spoke by selection, right? By natural selection, some individuals survive longer and can reproduce more efficiently than others do. And that allows for adaptation, right? The traits of those individuals that survive and reproduce will become more common in the population. So that's evolution. In a specific example, let's say that we have a group of deer that are all a little different because some have thicker fur than others. Um, because of the natural variation, let's say some deer become separated from the rest of the group and there's a change in the environment. So in the very cold mountain environment, only the deer with the thicker fur are more likely to survive. So the environment, um, nature, the cold mountain uh, climate is nature that's selecting those deer with thicker fur to survive. And as years pass on, each generation has more and more deer with thick fur. And because all of the thin furred deer have died, death of the weakest. And thus, after many generations, you might even have a new species of deer with very, very thick fur that can't even um, resemble, they can't even mate with the original population that they came from because they're so different. So here's an example from the book. This is the last example um, I could talk about. Um, so suppose that plant species generally produce smooth leaves so normally these are smooth leaves, but a random mutation occurred that causes one of these leaves um, or one plant to have leaves that are covered with these like hairs. And this is actually an advantage to the plant because deer can only eat smooth leaves, not hairy leaves. So therefore the hairy leaves will survive long enough to reproduce and pass on those hairy leaf genes to the next generation. All the smooth leaves will be eaten by the deer, so they won't have enough opportunity to reproduce and to make more of the smooth leaves. So the hairy leaves will become more and more abundant in the population, 
And generations later, most plants within the population will have hairy leaves because smooth leaves are selected against. So who's doing the selecting and what is being selected? So again, you should think about what is who's selecting what. And many generations later, suppose some deer start becoming carnivorous. How can that have happened? So think about these questions. So in this case, the deer is doing the selection um, in a way. So only the plants that have hair on them, right? Nature is selecting those that have hairs because those are more able to survive in the presence of the deer. And suppose that now that all the plants have hairy leaves, the deer start to die because they have nothing to eat. They can't process. They, they really hate the hairy leaves. They just rather starve, let's say. So you have now a very big problem because the deer are all starving to death. But it just so happened that one deer has a random mutation that allows it to eat meat just randomly. So that one deer didn't starve to death because it was able to eat, let's say, mice or something instead. I'm making this up. And because that meat-eating deer ate mice, it survived long enough to reproduce and pass on those carnivorous genes to the next generation. So now we're starting a new family of carnivorous deer that can survive even when there are no smooth leaves. So now we have carnivorous deer. And again, this is an example, but you can apply this to anything. And this is how um, diversity of life exists because different organisms pressure each other to change in response to the changing environment. So here's another example. Um, I was in the aquarium the other day and I saw everyone crowding around this piece of kelp. And I'm like, why is everyone crowding around this weed? And as I looked a little closer, I realized that it wasn't kelp. It was actually a leafy sea dragon, Fricoderus equus. And this is an organism that's like related to a seahorse that's found in Australia. And you could think, how did this ever come to exist? And a lot of people would look at this like, oh, this must be God's creation because it's so intricate and it's so magnificent. And how else can this have ever come to be? But we could use the idea of natural selection and we can definitely come up with a hypothesis of how this happened. So suppose there were seahorses in Australia and all of them were getting eaten because they did not, they really stick out. They're very weird looking. There is one seahorse that had a random mutation that made it have these leafy appendages on it. Just a random mutation. And these leafy appendages allowed it to blend in with its environment. So while all the other seahorses that were normal got eaten, this one with the random leafy appendages was able to survive. And it survived long enough to be able to reproduce and pass on those leafy appendage genes. Generation after generation, you start having leafier and leafier seahorses that can survive in their environment because they can camouflage so well. And this is how you can have the production of a new species, like the leafy sea dragon. So we have to organize diversity and taxonomy is the discipline of biology that identifies names and classifies organisms according to certain rules. So all organisms are classified in the following categories. So they start off in domains. That's the most inclusive. So there are three domains of life. Domains consist of kingdoms. Kingdoms have phyla. Phyla have classes, classes have orders, orders have families, families have multiple genera, which is the plural of genus, and genus uh, genera have many species. So you have to remember um, the hierarchy and you can come up with your own mnemonic. Um, one that I remember using is Dear King Philip called out for good students. So domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So let's talk about domain first. All living things belong to one of three domains of life. The three domains of life are domain eukarya, 
Then we have archaea. And then we have bacteria. Those are the three domains of life. So eukarya contains unicellular and multicellular eukaryotes. And remember, eukaryotes are cells that store DNA in a membrane-bound nucleus. So eukaryotic cells have DNA stored in a special compartment called the nucleus. Domain bacteria are prokaryotes, and prokaryotes do not store their DNA in a nucleus. Prokaryotes are the most abundant living things on this planet, and um, they can live in most environments on planet Earth. So bacteria can absorb food, they can photosynthesize food, or chemosynthesize food, meaning they can use chemicals in the environment to make food for themselves as well. And finally, the third domain of life is domain archaea. These are also unicellular prokaryotes like bacteria. These can live in very, very extreme environments that probably look like early Earth. So we originally discovered archaea in hot springs, like very, very hot springs and very salty marshes. Um, and that's what early Earth probably resembled, very extreme conditions. However, later research um, discovered that we have archaea all over the place. We have archaea on our hands, they're on our tables, they're in the air, in plants, they're all over the place. But archaea are not like bacteria. In fact, they make proteins more like eukaryotes than other prokaryotes. So even though they're single-celled prokaryotes, they're very different from bacteria. They're actually more like eukaryotes in certain ways. So that's why these three domains are distinct. Bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes are the three domains of life. So domain eukarya is further divided into kingdoms. Right? Domains are divided into kingdoms. And I want you to know the four kingdoms, um, the four plus kingdoms of domain eukarya. The first are protists. And in fact, protists are, there are many kingdoms of protists. That's a side fact. But protists are single-celled eukaryotes, like algae or that paramecium we saw earlier, um, slime molds. So those are eukaryotes, but they're single-celled. Those are the simplest, most basic types of eukaryotes. We then have fungi. So kingdom fungi consists of molds, mushrooms, and yeasts. Um, sorry. We then have kingdom plantae, which are plants. So that includes mosses and ferns and uh, flowering plants, vegetables, etc. And these are multicellular. They consist of multiple cells. And these do photosynthesis. So this is like an orchid does photosynthesis. And finally, we belong to kingdom animalia. So everything from a sea sponge, which is an animal, to us. Um, again, it includes worms, insects, birds, fish, frogs, reptiles. Everything belongs to the kingdom animalia. And these are all consumers, right? We need to consume food for heterotrophs. So here are the levels of, of uh, classification. You should be familiar with how humans are classified. Humans belong to the domain eukarya, right, or eukaryotes. We belong to the kingdom of animals. We belong to the phylum of chordates. We belong to the class of mammalia, or mammals. We belong to the order of primates, so we are primates. We belong to the family of hominidae. We are hominids. We are the great apes. We belong to the genus Homo. And our species is Homo sapiens. You never say the species is sapiens. You say the species is Homo sapiens. Uh, the same, you say, so corn belongs to the same domain as us, eukaryotes, because they have a nucleus. But they belong to a different kingdom. Right? They belong to plants kingdom, plantae. They belong to the phylum Anthophyta, which you don't have to know. They are monocotyledons, um, dot, dot, dot. They belong to the genus called Zea, and the species is Z-maze. 
So 3.6 to 3.8 billion years ago, the first cells evolved. Um, so again, 3.6 to 3.8 billion years ago, the first cells evolved on Earth. And we can say that the first divergence happened um, between bacteria and archaea. So originally there were all these cells, but then there was this huge divide. They decided to, or decided, something in the environment pressured them to change. So one group became bacteria, another group became archaea. And it took another, um, some billions of years, right? So two billion years ago, the first eukaryotes came, um, arose on planet Earth. And those are thought to have arose from archaea. Right, remember that eukaryotes um, resemble archaea, so it's thought that we evolved from archaea. Right? Eukaryotes were an offshoot of the archaea domain. Within all of these eukaryotes, we have, again, different kingdoms. So there were offshoots. So protists went their own way, and then plants went their own way, and then fungi and animals diverged. So over time, Right, over the past 3.8 billion years, 3.6 to 3.8 billion years, this shows how life diverged. Right, and remember, uh, a common descent with modification. We all came from a single cell, but we modified ourselves at every step of the way. The way we name organisms is using binomial nomenclature. So it's a two-part name, it's like Homo sapiens, um, is always italicized and it's Latin. So we name our organisms in Latin, we italicize them. The first word is the genus, also called the generic name. So humans belong to the genus Homo. So Homo is the generic name. The second word refers to the species designation or the specific name or the specific epithet. Um, so sapiens is the species designation. So we always do generic name, specific name. So it's homo sapiens, genus, species designation. The genus is always capitalized and the specific name is always lowercase. So we could say a mouse is mus musculus. So what is the genus? that mice belong to, mus. Ficodorus equus was that leafy sea dragon, right? So equus is the specific name, Ficodorus is the generic name. And if you want to abbreviate them, we do the capital letter of the generic name followed by the lowercase of the specific name. So H, capital H, period, lowercase sapiens is how you would abbreviate homo sapiens. And that's important to know. Uh, which of the following are eukaryotes? So pause here. The answer is C, fungi. So like a yeast cell is a eukaryote. Which of the following do not store DNA in a nucleus? So the answer is, pause here, A, archaea. Right, those are prokaryotes. So here's a brief review of the characteristics of life. And now is a good time to pause before we move on to section 1.3, the process of science. So what is science and who is a scientist? So an interesting question to think about first is what do children and scientists have in common? And what do they have in contrast? So you can think about it now, you can pause the video if you really want to give it some thought. But one thing that scientists and children both have in common is curiosity. Right? Children are very curious and so are scientists. What do they have in contrast? Discipline, right? So children are not very disciplined, but a scientist is, uh, as a requirement, very disciplined. And we can think about science as disciplined curiosity. This is an interesting way to look at science. And the discipline that accompanies a scientist's curiosity 
is the rigorous and creative application of the scientific method. All right, so the scientific method is a standard series of steps used in gaining new knowledge. And what makes a good scientist? It's the ability to make insightful guesses and imagine clever ways to test if they're true. This is a generalization, but this is an interesting way to look at science and what a scientist um, is. So the scientific method is a standardized series of steps used to gain new knowledge through research, and this is commonly accepted by the scientific community. And it's divided into steps. So we start by making an observation. We then ask a question and consult prior knowledge to formulate a hypothesis. After making predictions, we interpret and collect data from experiments. Right? And that data and collection and statistical analysis would allow us to draw conclusions. And finally, we can publish those conclusions so the whole world can be aware of what we just discovered. So we're gonna go through each of these steps one by one. The scientific method is not linear. It's actually a process that is a cycle and it kind of feeds into each other. So we all start with making observations as scientists. So what do you see in nature? What's interesting um, about this pattern that you see? So this can be something when you're observing, you could just be walking down the street and you can be looking at a bird doing a weird behavior and saying, hmm, I wonder why that bird does that. Or you could be on the beach and you start seeing that only um, green seaweed grows in one part of the tide, like one part of the ocean, and only red seaweed grows on the other side. And you're curious, why does that pattern occur? Why is there only green seaweed on one side and only red on the other? So that's when you think of interesting questions. Why does this pattern occur? You then formulate a hypothesis. You know, what are the general causes of the phenomenon I'm wondering about? And then you develop testable predictions saying, if my hypothesis is correct, then I expect A, B, C, dot, dot, dot. You then have to do experiments to gather data to test your predictions. You can then do develop general theories um, to basically come up with overarching conclusions based on your data. And that will then allow you to make even more observations and then think of more interesting questions. So again, the scientific method feeds into each other and it's a never ending process. But it all starts with observations. So a scientist perceives something in the natural world with their senses. It can be something that you see, that you smell, um, something interesting that you hear. One observation, this is totally random, could be, let's say, in a high school, um, an observation was made that teens who eat a lot of chocolate have worse skin. So this could be just an observation. That kids or children, uh, teenagers who have a lot of chocolate uh, have worse skin than, than uh, most kids who do not eat chocolate. So this is an interesting observation. So I might want to come up with a hypothesis. A hypothesis is a tentative explanation for observations. It must predict an outcome using inductive reasoning. So inductive reasoning is when you make an observation about something or about two different things and you're inquiring about the relationship between the two. So a hypothesis using inductive reasoning because you're using creative thinking to combine two isolated facts into a cohesive whole. So I'm seeing kids eating chocolate and I see kids eating chocolate with bad skin, they have very bad acne. So I'm using inductive reasoning saying, oh, maybe something, uh, something's behind this chocolate consumption. You know, maybe eating too much chocolate might cause bad skin. And my hypothesis can be an if-then statement. So if you consume a lot of chocolate, then you will get acne. And this hypothesis is testable because I could design an experiment to see if chocolate consumption leads to bad skin. So again, it's important to realize that a hypothesis is not a hypothesis unless it's testable.
So you cannot test something um, like Zeus is watching over us right now, right? We can't test that. It's not a good hypothesis. You can't say, well, if Zeus exists, then he will strike a lightning bolt, right? That doesn't, it's not a testable hypothesis. We can't do anything about that. So you can think that if you'd like, but it's not a hypothesis um, because it's not testable. So our hypothesis for the teenager chocolate example is if teenagers consume chocolate, then they might be more likely to develop acne. So then comes the experiment. And an experiment is a series of procedures used to test a hypothesis. The manner in which a scientist conducts an experiment is called the experimental design. And a good experimental design makes sure that the scientist is only looking at the contribution of one specific factor to the observation, right? This factor is called the independent or experimental variable. So in the case of the chocolate example and the skin, I want to look at the direct contribution of chocolate consumption, right, to skin condition. I don't want to look at, I want to make sure that when I'm looking at skin condition, I'm only focusing on the effects of chocolate consumption, not other things. So I only want to have one independent variable, the one thing that I'm actually seeing, um, I want to test for what the contribution is to the observation I'm interested in. So the independent variable is the factor that you're manipulating and that you're testing for. And the scientist will change this one independent variable and then observe or measure what happens as a result of changing just this one variable. And remember, a good or a, really a valid experiment will only have one independent variable, right? You can't test, oh, what is the effect of chocolate and face washing on skin condition? That's not a very good experiment. And it's not really telling you much. It's more, it's going to complicate things, if anything. So well-designed experiments have not only independent variables, but also dependent and standardized variables. So I'm going to give you a totally new example um, when I talk about variables. Is how does caffeine vary by the type of coffee bean? So there are many different kinds of uh, coffee beans. And the experiment is... Do different kinds of beans have different caffeine content? So the independent variable, we said that, or the experimental variable is what we're testing. So we can, a way to remember that it, that's which, that which is manipulated. The independent variable is what you're manipulating. So think about what would that be in the case of this new example with the coffee bean? It would be the type of coffee bean. Right, we want to see, does caffeine vary by the type of coffee bean? So the only thing we want it to vary is the type of coffee bean. Right, is it a coffee bean uh, from South America or from Indonesia or from Africa, right? So we can have different types of coffee beans. That's the only thing we're manipulating, that we're changing. The dependent variable, the dependent variable, is that what you're measuring? It's that what is being measured. So that would be the amount of caffeine. So you manipulate the independent variable and then you measure the dependent variable. And of course, you need to have standardized variables. You have to maintain a lot of other conditions to make sure that you're only manipulating the independent variable. So think about it for a second. If you wanted to look at different types of coffee bean and test for the amount of caffeine, what would you have to standardize across all the coffee beans? Like the mass, for example, right? You can't take a bean from Africa that's five grams and weigh it against uh, and measure the caffeine compared to a South, Africa, uh, South American coffee bean that weighs three grams, right? You would have to standardize the weight of the mass of all the types of coffee beans, right? To make sure that you're only looking at the contribution of the type, right? Or the geography, where it's from. 
Another thing you might have to make sure um, that is standardized is how the coffee bean was processed after it was picked, right? So if they have different processing um, protocols, um, then the coffee bean, it's not going to really tell you um, how caffeine varies by the type of coffee bean, right? Because maybe what you measure is a result of the processing protocol. So in an experiment, oftentimes you really have to consider the standardized variables um, very thoroughly to make sure that you have a good control. So a standardized variable is a type of control. So with the exception of the independent variable, we said a scientist must make every effort to keep all other factors standardized so they do not affect the outcome. So these factors are all control variables, which are standardized variables, and controls are not being tested for their effects at all. Controls are being used for comparison. Controls are used for comparison. And in an experiment, you might have a negative control. And a negative control should never show an effect. And I'll explain what this means in a bit. A positive control should always show an effect. So a negative control should never show an effect. Positive control should always show an effect. And a good experiment should always have a negative control and, if possible, a positive control. Um, in some types of experiments, you might have a placebo, which is a type of negative control that's used to see the comparative effects of a treatment. So if you're testing for the efficacy of a new drug, you might have one group of people that have a placebo, which is not a real pill, it's like the sugar pill, which is a negative control. It should never really show an effect. So in many experiments, subjects might be divided into test groups and control groups. The test group is exposed to the experimental variable. The control group would be given the placebo. So they would not be exposed to the experimental variable. And if the control group that receives the placebo and the test group that was exposed to the variable both show the same results, the hypothesis cannot be supported. You would reject the hypothesis. So now let's apply what we just spoke about controls and experimental design um, to designing a sugar detecting dye. So I want you to think about, you just created a dye that can change color in the presence of sugar. So you have a mystery solution, you add a drop of your dye and it changes color. It changes, um, it turns orange anytime it has sugar in the solution. Would you just be confident if you see that a solution, a sugar solution changes orange? Should you be confident in your new dye? I would not be. You would have to make sure that it always picks up sugar and that it will not react with just water, right? It only reacts with sugar. So how would you want to test the dye to make it work? To, or how would you test the dye to make sure it works? So you should pause here and if possible, draw out in your notes a brief experimental setup. How would you test this new dye to see if it works, including the right controls. So what you would have to do is you would want to test your dye in distilled water, pure water that has no sugar in it 100%, right? You would want to make sure that there's no color change when you add the dye to pure water or to salt water. So those are negative controls. A positive control would be a sugar solution, something that definitely has sugar in it. So sometimes, so now if you see that 100% of the time the dye reacts with sugar, it's a positive control, and it never reacts with the neg as a, uh, the negative control, like the pure water solution, or the pure water or salt solution, then you could be convinced that your dye really does detect sugar um, accurately. And then you can market it. Sometimes you might have to test um, for diabetes by looking at the amount of sugar in urine. So you can use um, this thing, it'll, the urine will turn a different color in response to this dye, right? So you might want to manipulate the color 
that it can change. Maybe you can do, you can make it turn different colors um, in response to how much sugar there is. And sure enough, there, there is such a dye called Benedict solution. And um, depend, it's usually blue. And so if you were to add this dye to water, it would stay blue. But if there's any sugar in a solution or in urine, for example, there's a color change. And if there's a ton of sugar, it turns red. If there's a little bit of sugar, it turns yellow. Um, if there's a microscopic amount, it will be green. So it's kind of a, um, a gradient of colors that tells you how much sugar is in a solution. And we'll see this in uh, lab two in a bit. One more example is let's say you design a new pregnancy test. What kind of control groups would you want to use to test the efficacy of it? So a negative control, right, to test your uh, pregnancy test on would be maybe a child or a man, somebody who is definitely not pregnant, right? You would want to make sure that you always get negative test results um, for the negative control. And then you would want to take maybe an eight month old, uh, an eight month pregnant woman um, and make sure that your pregnancy test comes out positive. And on pregnancy tests, or at least the old ones, there are two lines. One that's a control line, meaning this is testing if the pregnancy test is even working. So this control line picks up uh, something else in urine that uh, reacts regardless if the test is active. So if you don't get a control line, that means the test is expired or something. So this is a built-in control in a way. Right? This is, in a way, a, a positive control to make sure that the test works. And then, of course, if there's no results, that means it's a negative test result. If you see two lines, then that would be a positive test result. So after your experiments, you would then collect data and record your results. These results must be objective. Right? You should not have your opinion. Um, your results of the experiment can be expressed in numbers, that would be quantitative data. So if you were record like how many um, how many birds fly over a certain uh, space per hour or something, that's a quantitative experiment. Versus qualitative would be how bad is your skin after eating chocolate, right? Using words, you can't really use numbers, um, or maybe you can, as we'll soon see, um, but most experiments would be quantitative in chemistry and physics um, and in biology sometimes, but in other types of uh, science, there might be qualitative. So like psychology, a lot of times, um, you might see on surveys like words, like fair, better, best, worst. And that's how you measure like in surveys. You can't really use numbers as much. So the results of an experiment can be quantitative, meaning numbers, or qualitative, using words. And data has to be organized so the results can be interpreted properly. And this is where charts, tables, and graphs come in. And data can't just be um, interpreted as you want. There's a system. We need to use statistics. And there are certain measures of variation that are important to take into account. One is called the standard error or the standard deviation. And this tells us how uncertain a particular value is. So if you're very, it says how far off the average of the data is. Um, so an example given in the book is say, you wanna predict how many hurricanes Florida will have um, the next year by looking at the past 10 years. So you wanna look at the ten, last, 10 years and calculate the average number of hurricanes so you can predict how many hurricanes there will be next year. If the number of hurricanes per year varies widely, meaning if one year there were 10 hurricanes but another year there was one, you're going to have a huge standard error. Right? So that means the average, right? The standard error tells you how far off the average could be. So if the average number of hurricanes is four, Right? That if you calculate all the hurricanes in the past 10 years and the average was four hurricanes per year over the past 10 years, and the standard error is plus or minus two, 
that means that your prediction should be between four, uh, I'm sorry, because of average of four would be between two and six. So it's four minus two and four plus two. So that will tell you the standard error, how far off the average um, of the data is. Another measure of variation is, to sit, eh, I can't say that word, statistical significance. Statistical significance. And that will take into account the p-value, the probability value. So this tells us how confident are we that the results we got are actually due to the experiment and not just due to random chance. So we like to say, so a p-value um, has to be less than 0.05, which is less than 5% um, due to chance, which kind of translates to we have to be at least 95% sure that the results we get are due to our experimental variable and would not have just been achieved by chance alone. So the lower the p-value, the greater the confidence in the results. Right? The lower the p-value, the better, um, the more confident you can be that the results you got are actually due to the experimental variable. And then you can really, really support your hypothesis with confidence. So I want you to take a second to look at this graph. Um, and the independent variable over here is the dose of vaccine. And what we're looking at is the dependent variable, which is the incidence of illness. So we're looking at three different doses of a vaccine. And we're looking at the incidence of illness in children. On a graph, the independent variable is always on the x-axis. That's what you're going to manipulate. So the different doses from zero, which is the placebo, or the negative control, there's no active vaccine, low dose, medium dose, high dose vaccine. That's on the x-axis, on this horizontal axis. That's what's being manipulated. What we're measuring is the dependent variable, and that's always on the y-axis. So that's what we're looking at specifically is the incidence of illness. So we're looking at either in green is any rotavirus illness versus in blue is very severe illness. So pause the video now and I want you to interpret the graph to tell me, does this vaccine work? And what vaccine dose would you administer for a general rotavirus illness? So pause here, and you can see here that compared to placebo, there is a definite decrease in the incidence of illness at any dose of vaccine. So the vaccine does work. You could then think about which dose um, is most effective. And I would say um, for severe cases, a medium dose is great. Um, but for a low or for any rotavirus illness, a low dose is, is pretty good. You get a huge reduction in the incidence of illness with even a low dose. So a low dose is, is the way to go. Here's another graph. And what you're looking at here are male and female rats that were either fed normal diets in yellow or fed saccharin, which is sweet and low like something found in Diet Coke in green. And what you're looking, so that's um, on the x-axis, but what you're looking at is the percentage that developed tumors. So again, the ones in green are the percentages with tumors that were fed saccharin compared to in yellow were the ones that were fed normal diets. So pause the video here. And I want you to give this very careful consideration. You're looking at male rats separately from female rats as well. So look at this data, and I want you to tell me, does saccharin cause tumors in rats? So in 1977, the FDA saw this type of data and decided to propose a ban on saccharin. They were convinced that saccharin does indeed cause tumors, uh, because these, you know, this data showed that up to, you know, 30% of male rats that were fed saccharin 
had tumors in their bladder. So this uh, led to legislation being put out that they should ban saccharin altogether and that they had to put labels on anything that had saccharin. And the tangled history raises an important issue. Um, why isn't science that clear cut? A few years later, they said, oh, it doesn't cause cancer and it's perfectly safe. So we have to look uh, scientifically and we can't just look at one study um, before coming up with a conclusion. So we have to look at the actual experimental design before we could take this data seriously. Um, it turns out the groups, uh, there were two groups of rats. 100 rats were given normal rat food and the other 100 rats were fed uh, saccharin. Um, but 5% of their diet was just saccharin. So think about that for a second. If 5% of your diet was just saccharin, you would probably die. You would probably definitely get tumors as well. Um, that would be hundreds and hundreds of cans of Diet Coke every single day for your whole life, since from birth till death. So upon that, it's not really that surprising. Um, it's actually surprising that uh, more rats didn't get tumors um, that were fed saccharin. 5% of their diet was just saccharin. So this was a little misleading. Um, and that's what led to the misinterpretation of the data. And also the rats that were fed saccharin weighed a lot less and had a lot of other diseases. So it wasn't even clear that cancer was directly uh, caused by saccharin. It could have just been an offshoot from something else, from malnutrition. So the scientists should have done more control, better controlled experiments um, before presenting this data. So it's definitely misleading. And you really should keep in mind that no matter what headlines say, um, one study, especially a small one, cannot tell you the whole story. So you have to look at multiple sources that are reliable. Um, and lab one goes into more detail about what sound science is versus pseudoscience. So this is one more graph I'd like you to take a look at. Um, so here you're looking at the years of um, organic food sales and uh, the sales in millions, how much um, organic food has been selling. And you're also looking at a different variable, which is the individuals diagnosed with autism. And this is accurate data. What this statistical thing means, this R is correlation. And it, uh, the closer to one it is, the tighter the correlation between the two data sets are. So a correlation of one means there, as one increases, the other one increases proportionally. So this is 0.997, that's very, very close to one. And this p-value is less than 0.0001. Remember, a p-value, as long as it's less than 0.05, it means statistically significant. So if this is statistically significant data and you see that autism and organic food sales are both increasing um, over the years. Does organic food cause autism? Right, so you should be saying absolutely not. Right? Just because two variables are correlated does not mean that one causes the other. And this is very misleading. And some people who aren't familiar with the scientific method might be misled to think that organic food does cause autism and might stop buying organic food or might uh, post something on social media saying something about this and that would spread uh, more misinformation. So again, based on a graph, a lot of misleading um, conclusions could be drawn. You have to look beyond just one graph. You have to look at multiple sources. And it's always important to be a cynic, C-I-N-A-C, -C. correlation is not a cause. So always be cynical. What does this mean? I'm going to give you an example, right? Just because something is correlated, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's causing it. And I'm going to give you a fact that I want you to try to explain. Teenagers who consume more, uh, more ketchup perform worse on their SATs. That's actually a true statement. Teens who consume more ketchup perform worse on SATs. And if we were in a class together, 
I would like to hear multiple um, different hypotheses as to, you know, is this true? How can this be? Do, how can ketchup make a student do worse uh, on an SAT exam? So think of your best guess now. And it turns out that ketchup itself does not have anything to do with SAT performance, as you hopefully have concluded on your own. But it does result, um, it has a lot to do with socioeconomic status. And teenagers who don't have access to good education, educational resources and tutors um, and other study groups might have to rely on a lot of fast food, right? They don't have a lot of money or they don't, they're usually having a lot of fast food, which is maybe a lot of fries, um, chicken nuggets and things that ketchup usually accompanies. So this is a study that was, it's true. Um, and it sounds absurd when you think about the relationship of ketchup and SATs, but those teenagers who do happen to have more ketchup in their diet do happen to perform worse on their SATs. So again, correlation is not a cause. And you always have to be cynical when presented with data like this. So finally, after you draw your, um, after you have your data presented, you could then draw conclusions. Um, the data have to be interpreted to determine whether or not the hypothesis is supported. If the prediction happens, like as you predicted, everything went according to as you predicted, then you say your hypothesis is supported. If not, if the results did not go according to your prediction, you have to reject your hypothesis and go back to the drawing board, really. You have to go back to a different hypothesis. When there is enough data to convincingly support or falsify a hypothesis, you will then submit a manuscript to a scientific journal. So you type up all the information about how you designed your experiments, all the background about the experiment, the data, all the charts, tables, um, and graphs, and your conclusions, and you're going to uh, submit it to a scientific journal. And there are many scientific journals you might have heard of. There's Nature and Science and Cell and New England, New England Journal of Medicine are, are some that are very, very famous. Uh, so these scientific journals take these manuscripts, take these write-ups of experimental design. They're basically lab reports um, and they peer review them. And what that means is they have experts in the field look over that data to make sure it could be repeated and that it's legitimate. So this is a really important part in the scientific method. We don't just accept whatever, what anybody's experiment uh, tells us. We don't say, oh, it must be true. Other experts in the field have to repeat that experiment exactly the way the original one was done. The data has to be exactly the same before we can say that it's true. So the scientists try to duplicate um, the results. Um, if not, they'll dismiss the published findings. And only if the conclusions are verified many times, the data will be published for the whole world to see. And the government, the NIH, publishes um, all these journals, all the articles for us to see. So the way it works is labs can apply for grants from the government. The government might give them money for their experiments. And in exchange, they share their data their scientific knowledge with the government. And that's how it becomes universally um, accepted and universally accessible. Um, and again, science is always changing. So just because something is published, it doesn't mean that it's 100% the truth. Somebody else can come up with a different experiment and that study can then be debunked. So science is always evolving, right? Pun intended. So here's the overview, right? Making observations and asking questions. We consult prior knowledge. We want to look at other people's experiments too. You don't have to do double the work. So we want to look at what's been done before um, and then come up with a hypothesis. We make predictions that, okay, so if this is true, then I would expect to see this. I do my experiments and uh, collect, interpret my data. Then again, I'm going to consult maybe other experts in the field, um, look at other papers before I draw conclusions based on my experiments. If my conclusions are, they look good, I'm gonna send them to a journal that will have them be peer reviewed by experts and only if they can be repeated and validated, they'll be published for everyone to access.
So back to the example of the chocolate consumption and acne. Again, the observation was that teens who consume chocolate have worse skin. What are the independent, dependent, and standardized variables? How would you measure your data, quantitatively or qualitatively? Would you have a placebo? Suppose you notice that the chocolate consumers in fact do have more skin conditions. What could you conclude? And what follow-up experiments would be required? So this would normally be an in-class discussion, but I'd like you to take a few minutes to think about this on your own, just to do the mental experiment of how you would design this experiment. You can pause here. Um, I could just tell you just in a few uh, words, the independent variable is that which you manipulate. So you would have to have two main groups of students, and the only thing you would want to differ between the two groups is chocolate consumption. Uh, the dependent variable would be skin condition. How bad is their skin? Um, and that could be measured qualitatively, right? They could maybe, uh, maybe submit pictures of themselves and they could be rated from like bad, not that bad, fair, good, great, something like that. Or maybe there could be some algorithm made that can look at the pixels of discoloration and put that into a quantitative number as a percentage of clear skin, right? So I hope you're understanding uh, that. So you can measure uh, skin condition, which is the dependent variable, quantitatively or qualitatively, depending. And importantly, you must have standardized variables, a lot of them. So when you're comparing, let's say two groups of 50 students each, one will have chocolate, that's the independent variable, the other will not. So we have one test group that eats chocolate, the control group does not eat chocolate. But everything else has to be the same. They should have the same caloric intake, the same diet, the same skincare routine um, as each other for the entire duration of the experiment. In addition, the subjects themselves have to be standardized. So they should be the same age, um, same sex, um, ideally, same um, environment, like same weather conditions. You could go, you should really go crazy with this. And the key to a good experimental design is how thoughtful you are with the controls. So if you're not thoughtful with controls, you're not doing a good experiment. Um, that's actually key, um, is thinking, how are you going to convince your audience of what you're trying to prove? So you have to think about how you can be challenged and take everything into consideration and almost build that into your experimental design. I, I hope that makes sense. You're trying to design an experiment with controls that are so convincing, right? And you're, so you're saying it's definitely the independent variable that's causing what I'm observing and nothing else because I took everything else into consideration. So with that said, let's say you do in fact see that students who eat chocolate have worse skin in the end. Should you be convinced that chocolate causes uh, worse skin? I would say no. Maybe they're correlated. There's definitely a correlation, but we don't. We can't say it's caused, because for that you would have to say that anybody who eats chocolate, or like any teenager who you force feed chocolate, would automatically get acne. And we know that's not the case. It turns out that teenagers who have high fat diets actually do secrete more sebum, more oil on their skin. So there is a correlation between high fat diets and oil secretion on the face. That's a cause, um, that's causative. However, right, the chocolate, and then of course, if you have oily skin, you're gonna have more acne breakouts. So there's a link between high fat and acne um, and chocolate happens to be high fat. To break that down, to come to that conclusion, you might have had to do lots of experiments, maybe using one group that has fat-free chocolate versus one group that has high-fat chocolate. And you would have to see that the non-fat chocolate group was perfectly fine, just like the placebo group. So it's not just the chocolate, it's the, the fat content. And again, that's not a per this is more hypothetical. It's more of, of an example. So take a second to do this rapid response question. We'll pause here. So in the vaccine experiment, one group of babies was injected with the placebo solution. And the purpose 
was for a comparison to compare with the babies that are vaccinated. So C is the answer. So I want you to determine if the following statement is causative, is it causation, or correlative, correlation. So teens who consume more ketchup perform worse on SATs. Is that causation, correlation, or neither? So that is actually correlation. There is a correlation between those two. Teens who consume more chocolate have worse acne. So again, that's correlation. That's not really proven. Um, organic food consumption leads to autism. That is neither. That is bogus. So pseudoscience. Fake news. A mutation in hemoglobin leads to anemia. So that would be causative because a specific mutation in the hemoglobin protein can actually cause a reduction of oxygen in your blood. So that's, that can cause it. Um, the book gives a hypothetical example of a new antibiotic that can treat ulcers. Um, I'm not going to go through this in detail because the book basically walks, walks through it, um, but it says that there's a new antibiotic B that might be better than antibiotic A. So they divide the group. Um, they have a control group with people with ulcers who are untreated with antibiotics, and they're given a fake placebo pill. And they have two other groups. One is treated with antibiotic A. The other group receives antibiotic B. After the full dose of the antibiotics, they do an endoscopy at all the subjects. So it's like a little camera that goes in and can look at the internal organs for ulcers, and they can uh, graph the data. Over here, this is um, the data. Uh, specifically, you can see the control group has the lowest amount of uh, percent of, that had the effective treatedness. The effective this is treated tumors, or sorry, treated ulcers. So the control group had only 10% effectiveness, which is um, from nothing, uh, compared to 80%. And we'll talk about these error bars. I'm going to go back to these error bars in a bit. Um, but at the end, after the endoscopies were performed, they concluded that uh, the hypothesis has been supported. And in fact, the test group 2 that got antibiotic B had more um, effective treatment than either of the other groups. So it's very important to look at graphs um, for how real they are. I want to take a look, I'm just going to go back for a second, at the other graph that shows what's called error bars. And that's what shows the standard error. So I didn't point that out before. Um, so this shows the variation in each measurement. So this point represents the average of all the data. But these error bars show how far off the average is. So the larger the standard error, the larger the standard bars, the less confident or the less precise the data is. You see the less accurate the data is. So going back, um, you could look over here, um, just a couple of facts about lawsuits about settlements that were made against big companies for their false claims. So there's a cost to being careless. So just some examples you could read that are uh, quite remarkable. Um, biggest of which over here is because Dannon on their yogurt products said that scientifically, quote unquote, and quote unquote, cl clinically proven um, to boost digestive and immune function on yogurt. Um, and they were sued for $45 million for those false claims. So it's important to be uh, scientifically accurate. And in lab one, I'm gonna have you read more about Himalayan salt lamps and whether that is sound science or pseudoscience.
So if a hypothesis is supported by repeated experimentation, it may become a theory. And a theory is a not just a, a guess, like, oh, I have a theory about that. That's not what a theory is in science. A theory is a well-tested explanation for a broad set of observations. So what a theory does is it joins together two or more well-supported and related hypotheses. So in our example, um, like the theory of evolution is not just a guess, right? The theory of evolution is a well-tested explanation for the unity and diversity of life based on a broad set of observations by hundreds of thousands of scientists by now um, since before, even before Darwin. And this joins together multiple hypotheses about the origin of life and descent with modification and natural selection, etc. And a theory may need to be changed at some point in the future to explain any new observations or experimental results. So science is different than religion in some in many ways, and one of which is that it could be changed to explain any new observations or experimental results. So the science of today is not necessarily the science of tomorrow. Um, and a scientific law is how we define a factual description of natural phenomena. So a scientific law is not trying to explain something, right? A theory tries to explain a broad set of observations. A scientific law is just a factual description of something that's uh, observed in nature. And I'm not going to go too much into this, but as an example, the law of gravity um, in the 17th century describes how two different bodies in the universe interact with each other. And that's just the law. It is, that just is a fact. The law of gravity. Um, but Newton's law of gravity doesn't explain what gravity is or how it works. It wasn't until three centuries later when Albert Einstein developed the theory of relativity. Um, and then scientists began to understand what gravity is and how it works based on multiple um, observations and well-supported hypotheses. So that's a law versus a theory. Some theories in biology include cell theory, which mean, um, which is all organisms are composed of cells and all cells come from pre-existing cells. We'll talk about that in chapter four. Um, other theories are evolution, like I spoke about, and homeostasis, which we spoke about as a characteristic of all living things. So this is how you would kind of map out a scientific method. You start with an observation and a question. You start with many hypotheses, and after experimentation, you can start rejecting them one by one until you come up with um, a good hypothesis that you can test with multiple experiments and see if you can confirm your predictions. So this is a good time to pause before moving on to the final section, which is very short. Um, we'll talk about some challenges facing science today. There are several challenges facing science today. And in just about 10 minutes, we'll highlight three of these, um, including emerging diseases, climate change, and biodiversity and habitat loss. So emerging diseases. Over the past decade, several new diseases have been in the news from avian flu, H5N1, swine flu, H1N1, SARS and MERS, which are both coronaviruses. Um, Ebola um, was a big scare. And I mean, as of this recording, um, SARS-CoV-2 is a very hot topic, um, unfortunately. And SARS-CoV-2 is a novel coronavirus um, that caused a global pandemic in 2019. And a vaccine is still being researched um, as of today. Where do emerging diseases come from? There are many sources. Um, there could be new or increased exposure to insects that carry diseases or animals. So oftentimes rodents and insects might have uh, parasites or bacteria that can be pathogenic, that can cause um, diseases in humans. Um, so historically, plagues oftentimes were, were transmitted uh, by rodents or insects. Uh, globalization. Right, as we increase transport and we can fly and we can uh, take um, even the accessibility of uh, 
you know, air travel and sea travel, we have more routes to go different places um, than ever before. So that allows more spread of diseases. So globalization has definitely allowed um, diseases to go from one part of the world to even isolated communities that would never have been accessible. Uh, changes in human behavior oftentimes can lead to a disease, and that can just be uh, the use of technology. So Legionnaire disease is an interesting example of, uh, it's like a pneumonia that's caused by a bacteria, um, but this disease did not exist um, before the 70s. So in 1976, uh, Legionnaire's disease emerged, and it was because these large water towers um, for air conditioning systems, which were new, like state-of-the-art, um, had bacterial contamination. So these uh, hotels would have a lot of bacterial contamination in their water towers for their AC units, and that would spread this pneumonia-type um, disease through the showers and through all the water sources. So that's a disease that was a result of a use of technology, like an air conditioning. And of course, um, it can be a disease resulting from pathogens that mutate, um, like a virus, and that change hosts. So an example would be coronaviruses. And we can go on and on about um, what we know about coronaviruses, um, but we know that there are animal origins. Namely, bats um, are very, um, they're known as reservoirs for viruses. They have a lot of viruses that naturally occur in bats. And what can happen is if bats are exposed to other animals, they can transmit their virus to an animal, and there can be an animal with close exposure to humans that could transmit it to us. Um, so SARS-CoV-2 um, and MERS-CoV, -CoV, sorry, SARS-CoV-2, um, SARS-CoV, MERS-CoV were all transmitted to humans from bats by civet cats or camels. So MERS was transmitted from bats to camels, um, and SARS was transmitted from bats to civets. Uh, and civets were illegally sold in Chinese markets um, as a food source. And SARS, the, the first SARS outbreak, was thought to come from these wet markets where a lot of different exotic animals are slaughtered on site. And oftentimes the blood of the different animals can mix. Um, and cause two viruses to basically combine into a super virus that can jump to a human. And if a human is infected, or if a human, let's say, buys meat um, and comes in close contact and inhales some of the, the virus particles, the viral particles, that could be a zoonotic virus. It could go from, uh, from animals to humans. It's called zoonotic virus. So we can go a lot, we could go on and on about that. Um, but I'd like you to watch this video at a bare minimum. This talks about, this is a, the best one I could find. It talks about SARS-CoV-2, um, the recent outbreak, what it is, what it causes inside the body, so what COVID is, and what we can do to prevent uh, the spread of COVID as well. So I highly, um, I mean, this is part of the assignment, actually, and I highly recommend spreading this video with your friends because it's informative and it's sound science to this, to, to this date. Another challenge facing science is climate change. And climate change describes changes in the normal cycles of Earth's climate that's attributable to human activity. So, of course, there's normal climate cycles on Earth, but climate change describes the changes that are due to human activities. And most climate change is primarily due to an imbalance in the chemical cycling of the element carbon. So normally, carbon is cycled within an ecosystem. However, due to human activities, more carbon dioxide is being released into the atmosphere than is being removed. So carbon, uh, the element is found in carbon dioxide gas, which is in our atmosphere. And normally there's a, the carbon cycle makes sure that there's an equal balance of all the carbon that's released from, let's say, animals as we expire can be used by the plants for photosynthesis.
but now due to human activity, we release more carbon into the environment. We burn a lot of fossil fuels. As we burn coal um, and oil, we release excess carbon dioxide into the environment. Um, and normally we would have forests with trees to do photosynthesis. They could absorb that carbon dioxide and convert that and produce their own energy in the form of sugar, right? Because they're producers. But deforestation has destroyed forests and replaced them with farmland. So there's less um, photosynthesis going on to use up the CO2 that's being released into the atmosphere. The increase in CO2 causes temperature increases called global warming. So because of the increase um, in CO2, it traps the heat from the sun in our ecosystems, like in our environment. So what happens is all this, the heat can go in, but can't go out. So it's like a one, uh, one way trap. So all the heat gets trapped in our environment um, because these gases, these greenhouse gases that are produced, like carbon dioxide, um, allow the sun's rays to pass through, but they absorb all the heat and radiate all the heat back to earth. And this is called the greenhouse effect. It's called the greenhouse effect because almost like a greenhouse, it's trapped, right? We're trapping all the heat inside. Um, and that of course can cause um, climate change and that can cause certain ecosystems to deteriorate, which can allow, or which could allow certain organisms to thrive, but most will perish with drastic changes um, in climate. So as Earth's ecosystems change, we're going to see an increase in habitat loss and decreases in biodiversity. So there's a climate change video I'd like you to watch that talks about um, how much trouble we're in right now, which is a bit um, different scenarios, um, a little bit of data, some of the politics, and at the end it talks about what you can do to prevent climate change. Um, and there's a little graphic over here. But we just left off as global warming. It will change Earth's ecosystems. It's going to lead to biodiversity and habitat loss, which is the third challenge facing science that we'll discuss. Biodiversity is the total number and relative abundance of species, the variability of their genes, and the ecosystems in which they live. So it's basically the variability and diversity of all living things uh, and this is all decreasing on planet Earth. So it's estimated to be as high as 8.7 million species on planet Earth. Um, we only know about 2.3 million of those that we've named um, and according to taxonomy. Um, and extinction is the death of the last member of a species. And we lose hundreds of species every year due to human activities. And right now, most of the species represent a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction that were once on planet Earth. And a huge majority of our species are just used for our food. So most of the animals on this planet are just cows and chickens that are used for humans uh, because we've basically killed off most of the biodiversity on this planet um, for the past 10,000 years. Two specific ecosystems are particularly in danger. So tropical rainforests and coral reefs are two ecosystems that house a lot of biodiversity. So the tropical rainforest has very exotic orchids, um, tons of insects and different monkeys, and the coral reefs have tons of different sponges um, and coral. Uh, coral is the, a deposit. Um, but they provide habitats for a lot of other uh, marine life. So beautiful jellyfish and uh, lobsters and other fishes. So they're very rich in biodiversity. But due to human activities, both of these ecosystems are in danger. Um, so due to a lot of the plastics and chemicals that we release into the oceans, um, so it's a lot of pollution, we're damaging the coral reef. Um, and also due to deforestation, and climate change, we are threatening the rainforests. So we depend on healthy ecosystems, not only 
um, the animals, the other animals there. We rely on ecosystems for food sources, um, for raw materials, and also to discover new medicines. Um, and there are two specific examples, of, and they're pretty you know, close to us, uh, that resulted in unintended consequences. So in Mississippi, the Mississippi and Ohio rivers were once drained um, and levees were constructed and it kind of backfired because it worsened the flooding and it ruined all the farmland. And then we had a serious loss um, in a lot of uh, the habitats. So that made a lot of the land unusable in the end. Um, that was human intervention that they thought, oh, we can engineer a way uh, to prevent flooding. It actually worsened the flooding um, and had a huge loss uh, to the ecosystem. Um, and then as the South American rainforest, the Amazon is we're deforesting um, at an unprecedented rate. So deforestation means the removal of uh, trees uh, and we're killing species in the process and we're decreasing the availability of lumber. Um, so we're eliminating biodiversity and also getting rid of possible resources that we can use for new discoveries. So like for example, uh, chemo, the first chemotherapies were discovered uh, in the bark of a tree. And by eliminating these natural um, ecosystems, we're depriving ourselves of possible discoveries. So here's a summary of the major threats to biodiversity. And one we spoke about was climate change, right? So the increase in temperature um, in the atmosphere has major effects on the environment. Um, habitat loss and degradation, right? That can be due to a natural disaster or by anthropogenic activities, meaning human caused um, activities like deforestation. Uh, pollution is another thing that threatens biodiversity invasive species. So as we uh, transport species from one place uh, on Earth to another, it can actually overtake too many resources and cause the death um, or unintended consequences to other native species. Overexploitation is another uh, major threat to biodiversity uh, because we over harvest certain species um, and they can't reproduce naturally fast enough to keep up with the human demand. So a lot of fish, for example, Cape Cod, close to home, uh, used to be a bounty of cod. And then there was a huge over-exploitation over of it. And now it has to be more regulated. And finally, there are other potential threats that are uh, threatened biodiversity, like epidemics. Um, like avian flu is an example that threatened chicken or bird biodiversity. And unfortunately, humans had to kill over a million chickens um, to get rid of the source of avian flu. So that is all for chapter one. Um, as a reminder, you should complete the Connect Lecture Review 1 assignment that's based on all this content and study for quiz one, which is this, uh, this weekend coming up. And it's based on everything we discussed right here. So I hope uh, you learned something, and I hope that is pretty clear. Um, and please email me with questions, as always, if you have any questions or comments. Okay, I'll see you next time for Chapter 2.